Bless the Lord Jesus. I want to greet you tonight in the exalted name of Jesus, our soon coming King. Amen. I deem it a privilege one more time that we are able to do another Bible study session with you. I pray God that the session tonight will be enlightening, but also will be a session where we are moved to a point where we understand, amen, the importance of living for God and for living God to the best of our ability, living, up to, living for God, God's way. Tonight, before we start the session, I'm going to ask us that we just bow our heads as we open up the session tonight in prayer. Great God, we thank you, Lord God, for your mercy, your love, your grace, your loving kindness, which is better than life. We thank you tonight that we are here one more time to break bread. We are thank you, Lord Jesus, that we are here one more time to speak the word of God. I pray, God, that you'll give me clarity of thought. I pray, God, that you'll help me, Lord Jesus, to speak the word of God, amen, with the power and the authority which comes directly from me. I pray, God, that you'll bless me, search me, and know my heart, I pray. And I pray, God, that you'll touch every single individual, every person who is on this session tonight, that they will not just be hearers of your word. You said in your words that we with all shall a young man cleanse his ways, but by taking heed to the word of God. And God, we deem it a privilege that we are able one more time to look into the perfect law of liberty. That we have one more time, Lord Jesus, to look into your word. Because we are about to speak on a very important topic, something that I strongly believe, amen, has affected all of humanity, something that has caused us, amen, that caused you to step out of heaven, amen, to enrobe yourself into flesh and to die on, a Cal on Calvary's cross, amen, so that we can be reconciled to you. As we are about to talk on this very important topic, help us, Lord Jesus, to, to have keen ears to whatever is said tonight. And help us, Lord Jesus, to the best of our ability to try to apply where we have gone wrong. Help us, Lord Jesus, to make amends. And help us, Lord Jesus, that at the end of this session, that somebody, amen, will turn around. Somebody will want to say, God, I yield to you. We look to you tonight in the most exalted and holy, the matchless name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. God bless you again. Amen. Welcome to another Bible study. Amen. I, I, I'm humbled to be here tonight. And even the topic that God has laid on my heart, praise God, I am I, I am asking God to give me uh, the wisdom to expound this particular subject area. I pray God that as we go into the word of God tonight, praise God, that we will not just hear what I have to say, but we will understand the spirit behind what is being said. And I pray God that at the end of the session, that we will become out as better Christians, firstly in our mind, but the Bible says it with our mind that we serve God with our hearts, amen. And then we will walk, praise God, a more perfect way, trying to serve God to the best of our ability. Tonight I'm going to be sharing my screen and I pray God as we go through this topic, as we go through this subject tonight, that what is said will move somebody to want to serve God in a better way. Praise God. Now, I'm going to share my screen. Praise Jesus. So tonight we look at the subject, the consequence of sin, the consequence of sin. Our key verse tonight is from the book of Romans chapter six and verse 23. And it reads, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, this particular verse was written by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is a prominent figure in the early Christian church. We know him because he was the person who started the missionary journey in Acts chapter 13. We know him because he has established many churches and he was the person 
who had written many books in the New Testament. However, we realize that the Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Rome. And even though he did not establish this church, it was his, his desire that one day he would have visited this church. It is said that this letter, the book of Romans, was written around AD 56 to about AD 58. Amen. And it, 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 the letter addressed to the Christians who were in Rome. And in Rome, it was a mixed society. It had both Jewish and Gentile believers. Amen. And Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. And it was, it was, it was a diverse city. And it was a significant center for early Christianity. And it was for this reason that the Apostle Paul uh, wanted to go to Rome because of its significance. It was a great city of the time. Praise God. When we look at the book of Romans, we realize that uh, in Paul's writing to the church at Rome, he, he, he explained many things that today form the theological foundations of our Christian faith. He looked at subjects such as like salvation and subjects like the justification by faith. He looked at the role of the law. Amen. He, he, he spoke about things including the plan of salvation and, and how Jews and Gentiles can work together. Amen. He wanted to establish a strong relationship with the Roman church. And, and, and therefore, he, he dealt with all these topics. He, he looked at stuff like sin. Um, it is said that there are very few topics that were not touched, theological topics that are not touched in the book of Romans. Topics like eschatology, which is the study of the end times. And there are a few others. But for the most part, the book covers a wide area of theology. And one of the areas that we are going to look at tonight is this very important area that we call hamartiology. Amen. And, and, and you might wonder, what does that mean? But this is something that the Apostle Paul dealt with. When we read Romans chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8, for example, he dealt with this topic so much. He showed you, for example, his struggle. Um, even though he wanted to do good, evil seemed to keep on presenting itself. You know, he he showed us that, look here, there is there are some things. All have sinned, he said in Romans chapter 3, and have come short of the glory of God. Amen. And it, it shows us that the importance and, 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 and how important it is for, for us to understand the whole subject of sin and what it's about. Now, in theology proper, there is what is called systematic theology. And under systematic theology, there are different branches. Amen. And most times you'll hear people talk about stuff like Christology, which is the study of Christ, or Bibliology, which is the study of the Bible. Amen. Or eschatology, which is the study of prophecy. But there is also a branch, or angiology, the study of angels and demons. And, and, and the list goes on. Amen. Um, pneumatology, the study of the Holy Ghost. But there is a branch of systematic theology that God has has led on my heart and I've been looking into this particular subject. Amen. And it's the subject of Hamar theology, which is the branch of theology that deals with sin and its consequences. I think that a lot of times we don't spend the time to recognize how deep, amen, how deep sin is and the effects that it can have, amen, on every child of God. Amen. So as I look at this subject era, I want us to understand that sin is a big deal. And it's something that we have to, to really focus on and ensure that we are walking upright with God. Amen. Because it is subtle and it has a way of removing us, separating us from God. So in the Bible, sin is generally understood as any action or any thought or any attitude that violates God's moral laws. Praise God. When we talk about God's moral laws, it is understood in the what we call the Judeo-Christian world, amen, as the, 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 anything that is hinged in the character of God. Amen. There are some things about God which does not change. And that is why, for example, there, 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 when, when we, there are some stuff that are in the Old Testament, that are repeated in the New Testament, because they are hinged in the moral law, the moral standard, and the moral character of who God is. 
And God reveals those things or those principles, amen, through his commandments and through his principles and through the teachings that we find in the Bible itself. So sin is any action or any thought or any attitude that violates, amen, the moral, God's moral laws or God's moral character, who God is. Sin can be defined as the falling short of God's perfect standard. God has a standard, amen, and anything that goes short of that, amen, it's considered to be sin. In the Old Testament, for example, amen, the, the Bible uses a Hebrew word. There are two Hebrew words that you will find for sin. One is more abstract than the other. For example, you have chatat, that is used 277 times, and it is used, praise God, in reference to things like, like the sin offering and stuff like that. And you have chata, which is about 80 times, and that is more uh, specific. It speaks towards the action, what the person is doing. However, the, the both words are related because it carries with it the idea of missing the mark. And that's what sin is. It, it carries with the idea of going astray, of transgressing God's commandments. So in the Old Testament, all through the Old Testament, we see where the Bible uses, for example, the, these terms, chata or chatat, amen, if you're reading in its original Hebrew, 277 times chatat, 80 times chata, amen. In the New Testament, which was written in Greek, we find the word hamartia, and it is used 174 times. And both the Old Testament and the New Testament conveys the same idea. They speak about sins, talk about us missing the mark, talk about us falling short of God's standard. Praise God. And this is very important because God has a standard that we must keep. God has a way that he wants us to live. Amen. And we know that things are crooked because we have that standard which we can look on, that straight line, which is the word of God. That tells us that anything that goes contrary to this, amen, misses the mark. It falls short of God's standard. Now, why is this important as I continue on my introduction? It's because sin is understood as a fundamental human problem. It's a problem that affects each and every one of us. There's no person that is born in this world who cannot say that they have not felt in some way or form, the consequences of sin, amen, either through sickness or pain or whatever it is, all of these come about because of sin. Now, sin is, a, as I said before, a fundamental human problem in that it, first of all, it separates us from God. Amen. I will find that in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2, where the prophet was writing and says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you and he will not hear. Because of sin, there is a separation between God and man. But sin not only interrupts our relationship, amen, going up, it, inter it affects our relationship across because it also disrupts relationships that we have with each other. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 12 to 13 talk about, talk about the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did it. Now we've seen some problems taking place here between the husband blaming the wife the wife blaming, and there's a lot of blaming. There's a lot of disruption in the relationship. And all of this happened because of sin. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 9, 9 says, He that covers a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeated a matter, spirit separated, sorry, very friends. In other words, what we realize is talking about transgression causing a separation between friends. Amen. It's because of sin why we malice each other. It's because of sin why we can't at no point in time decide to work together. What every time you look at that brethren or that brother and you decide that I'm not going to deal with them, none at all. I've decided that I'm going to write them off and I'm not dealing with it because of transgression. Sin had creeped in. Amen. And it has allowed us to not even want to be friends with each other. And I don't understand because it's an uncomfortable feeling. 
when you're walking around and you're in malice with each other, you can't say hi or you can't say hello. But that's what sin does. It disrupts relationships. Eventually, it leads to spiritual and moral decay. Amen. So Romans chapter 1 verse 28 to 32 says this. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, amen, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. And he started to describe them now. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, and, 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 and you have to be careful. Everybody will call you. And I'm going to tell you little things. You know, here what happened to this person. You know, here this. And it's not with an aim to solve the problem. It's whispering and biters, persons, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. We see the decay, amen, just because they decide not to retain God in their knowledge. In other words, they have decided to miss the mark, amen. That's what sin does. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, talks about the works of the flesh, and we can talk about them. They are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, Amen. Strive, sedition, here it says, envy, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such like. In other words, the list continues. And I must say, of which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things, praise God, uh, which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So what we realize is that sin is a fundamental human problem. It separates individuals from God. It disrupts our relationship. It leads us into spiritual and moral decay. Because spiritually, you have been removed from God. Morally, you start your standard of change. Amen. That is why when people start to drift from God, you realize that certain things about them change. Because the more you are removed, the more your moral compass has shifted. And that's what sin does. Amen. And it's not, it's only through repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation with God that individuals can restore a right relationship with God. But this is what happens, the consequences of sin. Tonight, I want to, under, to, to bring something to your thoughts. I want you to realize that there is, there, there is this deceitfulness of sinful thinking. And let me tell you what that is. You see, many times we as individuals we will entertain the idea. There, 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 there's, a, there's a common misconception that you can actually engage in certain type of sinful behavior. And you can do it freely. And we do it under the assumption that forgiveness can be sought afterwards. I was talking to a friend recently and he says that I only preach grace and I only see life through the lens of grace. So it doesn't matter what a person does or say, the grace of God is so broad, amen, that they're able to find forgiveness. But as he was speaking, I'm reminded of what the Bible says in the book of Jude, where it talk about um, giving a license for sin, amen. You're using grace as a license to commit sin. And therefore, it's very important that there is a misconception that we can engage in anything. We can do anything. We can say anything. Amen. Because at the end of the day, we can get forgiveness afterwards. However, what I realize is that this belief, and if you're not careful, it, it might not be the big things. But in some of our minds, we still go and we do some things. We say, oh, let me just go right here. So if it's wrong, we can find forgiveness later on. Let me just do this. Let me just shift this. Let me just try to do this or that. Amen. And we believe that when we do these things, at the end of the day, if I'm wrong, then I will be able to find some form of forgiveness for what I have done. And this, believe, brothers and sisters, it stems from a fundamental 
misunderstanding of the true essence I mean, the true nature, I mean, uh, the true consequences, the repercussions that come as a result of committing sin. You have to be careful when you stop and you sit down and you think. When the temptation comes, we must not just think about what we are doing. And the truth be told is that sin is something that feels good for the moment. That's, that is why people engage in it, because it feels good. But the problem is not the feeling good now. Is the, is the effects that come later. And the wise man, praise God, will, 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 will judge the matter and realize that, look, here, even though it feels good now, I cannot just live for now. So there is, there is a deception of sinful thinking. That is why the Apostle Paul on numerous occasions and the other writers would have said many times that we need to check ourselves Ensure that what you do, you are checking yourself all the time. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, and say, examine yourself, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except he be reprobate. In other words, the apostle was saying that, look here, we have to continuously have checks on our lives must continuously be looking to see if you are in the faith or not. He said, look here, prove your own selves. Make sure at the end of the day, when you have examined yourself, you are still in the faith. When you have examined your, yourself, you are still in Jesus Christ, or Christ is still in you, except he be reprobates. I, 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 and when I see that word reprobate, it reminds me of a lesson I learned many years ago, I was about 16 or 15 years old, and our pastor used to teach, Bishop Daly taught uh, the, 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 the young adult class. Well, it wasn't the young adult, it was the, the, that age group, the, the, those teenager years. He taught that class, and he taught a lesson, praise God, Talk spoke about the topic, the degradation of sin. And he used the example of the man that was around the get a reins and he was in chains and and he was mad and he was full of devils and he said he brought us a picture he painted a picture in our minds of this gentleman he said probably this gentleman had a house and a family probably this gentleman who had a job there's a possibility not most all of these were 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 were, were inferences they were not necessarily saying that it is so but the example he was bringing to us is to show us that there must have been something in the man's life for him to reach here. He degraded from where he was to a point where he was now in a grave among dead. He was now in chains and they had to chain him because of how wild he was. And that's what sin does. When, 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 you, when you have left, amen, and you have engaged, you realize that how far it will take you. Praise God. And, I, and I'm jumping ahead of myself. But at the end of the day, the man must have reached a place where he was now wondering, how did I get here? So every day we need to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith or not. Look at the people you're not talking to. I said, God, if the rapture should come right now, would I make it? Look at the situations that you're engaging in. If God should come, would you make it? So the James put it this way. James put it in James 1.12. He said, blessed is the man that endure temptation. He said, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. In other words, there is a relationship with how we endure temptation and our love for God. But guess what? I like the fact that he said, blessed is the man that endures in temptation. The thought is going to come that I can do this but never you put in the back of your mind that look here, I can just do this and I can repent about it later on. Think about the now and think about the what will come later. So Jesus made some statements. If, for example, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, he said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart, it comes from a word which actually doesn't mean that the person was always pure, but it speaks to a heart that has been purged. A heart that went before God and God was able to cleanse it and wash it. Therefore, we can align Matthew chapter 5 with Psalms 32, 
We said, blesses the man unto whom the Lord imputed not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. Praise God. Now tonight, as we think about this, my aim is to use what we learn or what has been studied through the subject of amartiology in relation to the consequences of sin. Tonight, our focus is on understanding the nature and the consequences that come with when we sin. We're going to look at it wholesomely, in a wholesome way. We're going to try to see what happens when I commit sin. If I decide to give in to this temptation, what are the things that will come as a result of me yielding to this? We want to explore how sin operates and its impact on our lives. Amen. And it's crucial for us to understand that sin is a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous threat that we must always be aware of. Amen. Whenever we face temptation, be aware that sin, brothers and sisters, is like a cancer that spreads insidiously and it corrupts every aspect of our being and it poisons our relationship with God and it poisons our relationship with each other. I want us to understand that sin is dangerous because it's really rebelling against God's will. It's trying to come against the authority that God had set up. Amen. Sin violates the moral and the ethical principles of God. And tonight we want to delve into what sin entails and the repercussions of giving into it. Tonight I want us to, to grab a, a, a notebook and I want you to make note of these seven things that we're going to talk about tonight. Seven things. And I want us to always remember this. Amen. We're not, I, 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 I know that at different points in time, things are going to happen. The Apostle Paul himself, as I said earlier, spoke about the struggle that he had. He spoke about the fact that when he wanted to do good, evil would present itself. We see these things. We know that the Apostle Peter at time messed up. We know that, 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 that things would happen at different points in time. But guess what, brothers and sisters? If when we are aware of its consequences, amen, we will be very careful of engaging in this dangerous threat to our Christianity, dangerous threat to our life. Something that if comes in, it replicates itself like a virus. And when it's done with you, it leaves you looking like nothing or nobody. I have seen people, good, good people in church, amen, who look like decent people. And once they have walked out, I've seen where people look like they're mad on the road. Amen. I've seen people who have gone even mad. And it started because they decided to go contrary to what the word of God says. I remember a sister come to me and she was saying, boy, I am happy. And I'm a part of the, the, the new converts class. Oh, we're talking about the whole subject of, of, of marriage and, and, and can two walk together except they agree. And she said, this guy um, came to her and, you know, she had to say, look here, no. And as, and, I, and, I, and as she said that, I'm reminded of our past. And I know of two stories, two personal stories, amen, where, per, where a pastor said, look here, I don't think you should do this. But no, sometimes we want to do what our flesh wants us to do. We want to do what feels right. We don't seek the counsel from the men of God. Amen. And therefore, and the two instances that I know of, one of the person is dead. The other one is on the road like a mad person. All because they rejected, amen, the word of God. The word of God is not just the written word. The word of God has to do with the Rima word. When pastor goes on the pulpit and he preaches a word, when the ministers deliver a word, Amen. When anybody delivers a real word from heaven, that is the word of God. And therefore, we live accordingly. Tonight, we're going to look at seven consequences, seven, seven things that will come as a result of sin. And can I tell you something? It will come. Once you start engaging in sin, it will come. Now, get your pen, get your paper, and make note of these seven things. Number one. There's an escalation of sin. In other words, sin often lead individuals further than they originally intended. There's a famous theologian who quoted it this way. He says, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. 
and it will cost you more than you want to pay. Let me say it again. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Not only will it do that, it will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you really want to pay. So sin will lead individuals further than they originally intended. A good example of this is found in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 32. And that is the story of a young man we know that they call him the prodigal son. A young man, he demanded his inheritance from his father. And he squandered it, we know the story, on wild living. But guess what? I believe that when he took that inheritance and he walked out, he did not know that the circumstance would become so dire for him. Because at the end of the day, he began to work among pigs. At the end of the day, he started to experience hunger and poverty. And all of this was the, as a consequence of his reckless living. They were, they, 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 because of the fact that he removed himself from his father's house, he was, was the, the, the consequences were far more severe than he likely anticipated it to be. But I'm grateful that in that story, we learned something too. Because ultimately, he, because of how far he drifted, because of how far he had gone and how long he stayed out there and what it had cost him, it led him to a place where he repented and reconciliation came about with, between himself and his father. But that's how sin operates. Sometimes our intention was not to do something bad. All we wanted to do was to cover ourselves. Amen. All we wanted to do was to ensure that we know, as he said, that lying lips is abomination unto the Lord. But a lot of us use lying as a present help in time of trouble. But the problem with it is simply this. When you tell a lie, in many cases, you'd have to tell another lie to cover that lie. And that's what keeps on happening. There seemed to be an escalation of where you started, from where you started to where you end up. That's why the Apostle Paul said to the church at Rome again, he said, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants to, he are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Amen. I can tell you this, that sin will lead you into dark places. And at the end of the day, it will make you feel as if you can hide from God. Sin, you start something and there's no secret sin. Because what you're going to realize is that it brings you places that you, you realize it, it exposes you. And even if at the initial stage it's not exposed to everybody, we must understand that everything to God is light. It doesn't matter where you hide, you can't hide from God. There's no place you can hide before God. As a matter of fact, it was God who knit you together in your mother's womb. And he knows the day of your death. Before a word is in your mouth, he knows it all together. So there's no hiding from God. So Isaiah chapter 29 verse 15 says, Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us? Who will know? But Proverbs 5 21 says, your ways are in full view of the Lord and he examines all your path. And I'm quoting from the, the, the NIV in this regard because I want to be clear. It says, your ways are in full view of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Amen. Everything is uncovered and laid before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Amen. 
You might fear the anger of your spouse and you don't tell them what you have done. You might hide something from your parents. Amen. You might try to do some things that you think that nobody knows about it. But guess what? God sees all things. Sin has a way that if you start it, it will pull you so far. Amen. Then you're going to realize that God, you were here all along. I could not hide this from you. It's important that whether we, we lie or we cheat or any other transgression that we do, the initial act can spiral into a series of increasingly harmful action. So again, the first thing about sin is that it will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you are willing to pay. There's an escalation to the effects of sin. Yield not the temptation, the apostle say. Or the Bible puts it, for yielding is sin. So the first thing, the first point is that we must stay away from this as best as we can. This disease, this cancer, this, this, this drug, because it only escalates and comes and becomes worse. It is like some of these drugs that people take. They start off with a little thing, but after a while, they do anything to get it. That's what sin does. It keep on driving you. It keep on pushing you. And you probably do one thing and you get satisfaction. But in order to get that satisfaction, you have to do two things. That's what sin does. It keep on building. And by the time you look around, you are so far drifted out of sea that you can hardly see land. That's sin. Tell somebody to stay away from it. Apart from that, number two is that sin does not just affect you, brothers and sisters. But it impacts others. Sin not only affects the individual committing the actual sin, but also it exposes other people to danger. It hurts other people. It brings disappointment. As I said before, all that is done in darkness will eventually come to light. And we can look at what the scripture has to say in regard to this. When you decide to start telling lies, when you start to behave a particular way, it's just a matter of time before your actions is going to affect somebody else. There's no such thing as a personal sin. You alone do it, but the truth be told, the impact can be so great that others can be affected. Let's look at an example in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10 to 20. And we're in Bible study, so I will be reading the scripture as we make note of what is taking place here. When you read Genesis chapter 10, chapter 12, from verse 1 to verse 9, we realize that Abraham was called of God. God instructed Abraham to leave his country, to leave his relatives, his father, his household, and to go to a land that he will show him. God said to Abraham that he's going to make his name great. He's going to make him a great nation. He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. He said, I'm going to bless people who bless you and I'm going to curse people who curse you. He said, through you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we know what happened. Abraham decided that he's going to leave not knowing where he was going to go. He obeyed God's command and without any form of hesitation, we we'll see that Abraham get his wife, who was Sarai, S-A-R-A-I, her name was later changed to Sarah, S-A-R-A-H. He got his nephew, Lot, and he got all his possession. And he went forth to a land that was called Canaan. It's important to know that at this point in time, when Abraham was leaving, he was about 75 years old. And I want to make note of this to make a point in the story. We see that, that Abraham had faith and he trusted God despite the fact that he did not know where he was going. He believed God's promises and he was going on a journey. And here it is that he traveled through the land that God promised him, the land of Canaan. And it's interesting. God, God made so much promise to him. 
Amen. God appeared to him at Shechem in our oak tree at Murray. God, God, God gave him so much promises and, and the thing that all of this land that before you, I'm going to give it to you. However, you have to understand that when God gives us a promise, sometimes there are going to be challenges. Sometimes things are going to come to challenge your faith. Because note this, as Abraham was journeying to the land that God promised him, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 10, we are going to read that there was a famine that struck the land of Canaan. And Abraham decided that, look here, Matthew, he could have stayed in the land of promise. There's nothing in the scripture that actually said that he sought God's guidance here. Because it was God who told him to leave Ur of the Chaldeans and to, and to come to Canaan. But notice that a famine came. And I strongly believe that God could have provided for Abraham in the famine. That would have shown the miraculous hand of God. But sometimes we try to do things our own way without seeking God. Because what is what our eyes sees, amen, uh, determine what the outcome is going to be. However, we realize that Abraham decided that, look here, there's a famine here. And in order for me to, to protect my household, I'm going to seek some refuge in Egypt. So let's look at what the scripture said, um, reading together. It said, there was a famine in the land. And Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there. And we're talking about how sin impacts others. For the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to the end into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. And, and I found that interesting because at this time, Sarah would have been about 65. If Abraham was 75, when he left, then we're looking at Sarah being somewhere 65. But if at 65, she was a very beautiful woman. I'm saying, Sarah to Sarah's wife, behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, and they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. What we saw is that Abraham, praise God, was telling Sarah to tell a lie. Now, the truth be told, you might say, and this has been debated, did, did Abraham lie because Sarah was really his half-sister? But he did lie because a lie is an intention to deceive. The motive behind telling Sarah to tell the Egyptians that she was his sister was to deceive the people so that if anything, they won't kill him to get her. Amen. Let's continue with the verse. It said, it came to pass that when Abraham was coming to Egypt, the Egyptian beheld a woman that she was very fair. The princess also of fear saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house and he entreated Abraham well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So here it is that the man bringing uh, Sarah. Luckily, him start the Abraham things because I was Abraham's sister, man. So I'm going to treat Abraham good because he's now wanting to have some form of relations with Sarah. But while he was doing that, thank God for the mercy of God in this regard because God started to plague uh, the house of Pharaoh. In other words, the people him start get sick. And Pharaoh recognized what was happening. I don't know how. Probably God spoke to him. Because God can speak to people who are not saved. I mean, worse to cover the people of God, God will do that. And when Pharaoh recognized what was happening, the Bible said, and Pharaoh called Abraham and said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? 
So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. And they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. We saw where uh, her life was placed in danger. Because guess what happened? All because Abraham decided that he was going to tell a lie. The lie would have been so bad that Sarah could have been placed in compromising situations. Amen. Just because of a lie. The intention didn't see that far. But the impact of sin is that it not only affects you, it affects others. How many times have we seen that through lies and through betrayal or other misconduct, the, the ripple effect of it can be far-reaching. How much persons are broken, are, are heartbroken when, when you look at a child that you have and we see that them start engaging certain things. When you look at a husband or a wife or you look at a, a situation, a friend or whatever it is and the lies and the betrayals and these other things that has had ripple effect to the point where other people are affected by it. I have known of stories where men, amen, because of where they stood, amen, when they backslid, many backslid with them. Why? Because of the of how the effect that they had on people's lives. Amen. What am I saying? Is that your sin is so, uh, have to be so careful because sin not only will bring you places that you don't want to go. Sin not only will make, will cost you more than you want to pay. Amen. And keep you longer than you want to stay. But sin also will impact the lives of people around you. Let us try, brothers and sisters, to live for each other. I pray for you. You pray for me. I live a life so that I can be upstanding before you. And you live a life that can be upstanding before me. Let us be Let us be uh, like chains with each other. Where as the devil tried to pull because the chain link is so strong, it can't be broken. Let us try to back each other when we realize that's what the Bible said. He that is spiritual should restore such a one with the spirit of meekness. Let us have each other's back. Let us not back off when we see the enemy coming. But let us try to understand that the action that I have can impact somebody else. I've seen where new converts come to church and persons who have been around for so long affect them so bad that they decide that they're not coming back to church. And I strongly believe that uh, you might say, boy, the person never had no backbone or have never mean God. Sometimes that's not even the case. Sometimes because of where they are, they are a child, they are young in the faith. Amen. And therefore we have, as the older ones should ensure that we are, our lives are upstanding because what we do will impact the other person. Your lies don't, don't just affect you. The lie that you will tell on that brother, amen, might have ripple really effect to the person's reputation. Amen. You try to damage, as it were, they create an image of the person's character. Don't tell lies about people. And sometimes, even if it's the truth, you have to be very careful that we don't damage people and kill them off. The betrayal, the misconduct, the ripple effect of sin, brothers and sisters, is far-reaching because it affects each and every one of us. I mean, something can mess up an entire body. I, 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 I've, you, I don't know if you've ever had a situation where a part of you got hurt. So you're walking and you step on a nail. Amen. Don't you think it, 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 it for some strange reason, it moves through your entire body. You feel the pain all over. Or if you've ever had a toothache, amen, it affects so much. That's what the body is. When you, when you do your sin, it impacts everybody. So point number one is that there is a ripple effect. It will bring you further than you want to go. Point number two is that there's, it impacts each other. It impacts others. Point number three is that there comes a point in time where it can become so difficult for you to repent. The longer you indulge in sin, the harder it becomes to repent and to turn away from it. There's a scripture we talk about having your conscience seared with hot iron. Sin can create a barrier between the individual and, 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 and to the point where it's only genuine repentance 
uh, can bring you out. Well, to be told, it's only general repentance can bring you out. What sin can create a barrier between the individual and general repentance, making it increasingly challenging to break free from its grasp. Sin can become so, so, so rough that at the end of the day, it, it, it's, it's hard to break. The more you indulge, it's the harder it is for you to stop doing that thing. The more you do some things, I've, 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 one brother was telling me one time about a situation. He said, look here, he got involved, but he said it before he went far. And this is a long, long time story. So I know it's years ago story, but before anything happened, the first time he just barely kissed the sister, he he cried because it felt bad. But after a while, he got so far that it never affected him anymore. And the deeper he go, it was harder for him to repent. That's what the book of Hebrews says. Multiple times, the writer would have given warnings. Don't do this. Don't go so far. There are consequences for doing this. Keep yourself. Avoid this. Five different times through the book of Hebrews that I've seen where multiple warnings are given for one who indulges and going far, too far into sin. Hebrews chapter 2, 1 to 3. Therefore, we are to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the words spoken by angels were steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? In other words, the writer is warning us. Don't bother engaging that. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 3. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my heart, lest they shall not enter into my rest. Praise God. It's a warning. Don't get involved. Hebrews chapter 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew themselves again unto repentance, seeing they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. What is he saying? Don't get involved. Don't go out there. Hebrews chapter 10. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remain no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' Lord died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment. Suppose he, shall he be through worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and an holy thing and had done despite unto the spirit of grace. For we know that he said, Vengeance belong unto me. I will recompense it the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing, brothers and sisters, to fall into the hands of the living God. Again, all of these are warning from the book of Hebrews. But to make a concrete example of how it is difficult to repent, we can look at the story of Balaam in uh, Numbers chapter 22, verse 22 to 31. Now, the Bible said that we know that Balaam was hired to curse uh, Israel. And for some strange reason, he was adamant that he was going to do it. That's what sin does. After you have indulge and you decide to go forward and i cannot tell you something so when you make up your mind to do something god not even going to stop you because sometimes and sometimes if he does it takes some dire things 
God has to come down with strict judgment for us to understand that, look here, you, what you're doing is wrong. Look what happened to Balaam in Numbers chapter 22. It says, and God's anger was kindled because he went and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. He was riding upon his horse, but his ass and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the age of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam not even realized what was happening, that this was God stopping the thing. Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the age of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyard, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the age of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. And the age of the Lord went further and stood in the narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right nor to the left. And when the ass saw the age of the Lord, she fell down upon Balaam. And Balaam, angered. So the man was just adamant. The man just decided because he had, when you, when, when, when you're so engaged, it becomes difficult for you to realize that you're, you're going wrong. It comes a point in time where black look like white, where, where darkness look like light. You have to be careful. The Bible said he smote the ass with a staff and the Lord opened the mouth of the ass and she said unto Balaam, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, because thou hast mocked me, I would therefore a sword in my hand, for now I would have killed thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, I'm not I thine ass upon which thou hast written ever since I was thine unto this day. Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the in So imagine, the, 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 the dumb animal saw what God was doing. And here he was supposed to be a man of God. Well, he was a, was, was, it was not true man of God. But he was, it was that God was speaking. And because he was so pressed into doing what he had to do, it found it difficult to retreat. That's what happened when you engage in sin. There comes a point in time where if you continue, it becomes difficult for you to find a place of repentance. The Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand and he bowed on his head and fell flat on his face. What has happened, brother, it becomes a difficult place because sin actually creates this barrier between the individual and the genuine repentance, making it increasingly challenging to break free from its grasp. It's like it grab you. It's like you have become a prisoner. It's like you have now become so, so weak to this thing. Let me tell you something. You see, once, if you never do something before, the temptation is not there. It might be there, but it's not so and rough. You see, once you have decided to do it one time, then brothers and sisters, it becomes hard to break. And that's why you have to be very careful. It separates you from God and the grip is so strong after a while, if you continue to indulge, if you don't find a place of repentance, there's a consequence where it becomes so difficult. You come to church every Sunday, not realizing that you're walking around with this weight. And it is still until you reach a point where you can find repentance and you realize the weight that you have been walking around with. It becomes norm for you to have that big bag on your back. That big bag full of malice, that big bag full of lies and and and, and speaking evil of, of dignitary, that big bag that 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 tell you that look here, you can't do anything and walk into the house of God, and it's okay because God will you have you have, you have just done less use grace as a license for sinning. Sin, if continued, reach a point where it is difficult for you to repent. This is why many people, when they have backslidden, you're wondering, how is it that with everything that is happening in the world, all that we're hearing in the news, everything that is so clear to us, but that's the problem too. When you walk out from God, your eyes have become so dark that you don't even realize, brothers and sisters, what is happening around you anymore. You don't discern the time. You don't understand the season. But guess what happened? You have become such a slave to this thing that you really don't realize that you're walking over a cliff. 
Oh my God. Sin creates that barrier. Becomes difficult for you to repent. That is why as people walk out, you wonder how is it that they continue and it becomes progressively worse and worse as they go deeper and deeper out into that, 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 that deceptive disease called sin. What started out as something mild becomes great. What started out as something that was just a handhold now becomes a tight grip. Because that's how the enemy works. But say, pre-adventure, you decide that you are going to, you have found the grace of God. You have found a place of forgiveness. And I pray God that irrespective of what we do, that we find a place of repentance. But can I tell that even though forgiveness is available to the grace of God, the consequences that come with sin may still linger. There are some consequences that even though you are forgiven, there are some things that, there are some scars that you will have for life. And the Bible is full of examples that demonstrate to us that there will be consequences for our actions. Amen. For example, if you look at the life of King David, who was the greatest king, I would say, in Israel. I mean, every, every other king, the Bible says, and they did this, but not according to their father, David. David was the marker. So apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the king of kings, David would have said to be one of the greatest king, if not the greatest king that ever ruled in Israel. But look at his life. Look at the, the permanence of the consequence. For example, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 to 27, we see where David committed adultery with Bathsheba. It was a time, and again, it goes back to point one. It started out where the kings were supposed to go to war. That's where it started. You're supposed to be on the battlefield. You're supposed to be in Bible study. You're supposed to be in church. But you decide that, look here. So for weeks, you don't come because, you know, it's not about church and uh, one one guy was telling me we need to understand that is is your relationship with God. It's not about coming to church. And while I understand what he's trying to say, I can see the enemy working through that the deceptive work of the enemy because he knows that we can only become strong when we are together. Amen. He knows that I need you and you need me. He knows that there's a word of encouragement that comes from you that is going to pull me. Amen. And keep me, your testimony, amen, your, your life, your overcoming thing, the thing that you have overcome, amen, that you can guide my steps and say, look, your brother, don't go there, amen, when you talk about these things. So the Bible said that David was supposed to go to war. And he decided, look, here, I'm not going to go to war. And he stayed on his balcony and he saw Bathsheba sitting second Samuel. He saw Bathsheba. Eventually, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And arranged for her death of her husband. Because we know what happened. She got pregnant. Amen. He called for um, um, Uriah. Amen. Um, Uriah decides he's not going home. Send Uriah at the front of the battle. And tell the men that when they when when they come upon Uriah. Let the men then back off from him. And we know the story well. He committed that sin. What other thing happened in 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 1 to 15. Which said Nathan the prophet confronted David for about this sin. Now, we know that David repented. There's no two ways about it. Psalm 51 tells us after he was confronted by Nathan the prophet, he wrote that powerful psalm, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercy. He said, Blot out my transgressions. Amen. We know that psalm, Psalm 51. Amen. The powerful psalm that David spoke about in terms of his repentance. He said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. He said, and cleanse me from my sin. He said, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He said, against thee, thee only have I sinned 
and done this evil in thy sight that thou may be justified. It's a powerful prayer now when thou speakest. He said, be clear when thou judges. He said, behold, I was shaping in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. He said, behold, thou desires truth in the inward part and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. He said, purge me. Here's a man praying now with his up and I shall be clean. He said, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. He said, hide thy face from my sin, praise God, and blot out uh, all my transgressions. Amen. The man was the man was just praying, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy holy spirit from me. He said, then will I teach transgressions thy ways. And see, the man was, was just praying. The man was just finding a place where he can repent, that where he can talk to God, where he can talk to God about his situations. But although David found forgiveness in Psalm 51, there are some consequences that come. There are some consequences that come because of his sin, some enduring consequences, some enduring effects that happened to him. Because of the, the he, he had to endure the effects on his family and on his kingdom. And there was continuous turmoil and strife. So, for example, even though he repented in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 8, and we see that uh, the child that he that 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 Bathsheba had, he became that child died. He lost the child. Not only that, because of the, the consequence of sin, his son Absalom. Rised up against him. So we see where um, Absalom came up and decided to rebel against him. Before he rebelled against him, there are other issues that took place. We see where Amnon raped his half sister Tamar. And because of that, Absalom became angry and he killed Amnon. Now, David never deal with the issue. So Absalom decides he, he ran away for a while, but when he came back, because the issue was not dealt with how he wanted to deal, he, he rebelled against David. Absalom strategically win war in terms of the in terms of the hearts of the people, and he eventually come to a point where his son declared himself to be king in Hebron. So all of this was happening because I've seen you know David was able to face betrayal. And abandonment. At one point in time, he must, have, he must have flee Jerusalem to avoid him, him very life being taken. Brothers and sisters, there are consequences, permanent consequences that will come. So even though you will find a place of repentance, what will happen? The consequences can be so great. Sin can leave a lasting weakness or vulnerability impacting future decisions and experiences you make you you, 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 you because you have you have fall for this it it, it kind of sows some things in your life that that it leaves some marks that 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 people not even people want, 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 want to trust you that's what the bible says be not deceived god is not mocked for whatsoever man sow that shall he reap that's that's a principle for he that sow it to the flesh shall reap Corruption. I want to talk about corruption. What you're reaping? You're reaping stuff like death. You're reaping stuff like emptiness. You're reaping stuff like frustration. You know, hard it is sometimes because of what you committed a couple weeks ago. Want to start go back. And can I tell you something, brothers and sisters? You have to be so careful. Because once you start going back, the consequences can be so dire that if you're not careful, you become worse than who you were before you get saved. It often, often puzzles me. How can somebody in church say a sum is still? You can't change. You know what has happened? You have lost that conviction to, 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 to change. The, the, the permanence of, of, of the consequences of living a life that's contrary for so long is still there. I heard a story of a father demonstrating what I'm trying to bring across here. He brought his son into the garage and he tell his son to take a nail and to drive the nail into the wall. And the son took the nail and he hit it into the wall. Then he handed the, the hammer 
until you want to, to pull back out the nail. And the young man went and pulled back out the nail. And the father said to the boy, what I want you to know is remove the nail hole. And so what do you mean, daddy? He said, that is what happens when you have indulged in sin. There's a possibility that the nail, the thing can be removed. But there are some permanent consequences that are, can be left. That scar. Amen. Some of us, we can hardly hold up our head because of the scars that come as a result of our sins. Brothers and sisters, let it be known that once you have committed sin, there's a permanent consequence that comes with that. Even though you can be forgiven, there's a whole mark that is left. There's a scar. It's like, it's like I can see marks on my hand that, that, that when I was a child, I remember when I was a young guy, I went to Hope Garden and run up a stairs, a metal stairs, and it, it bones my feet. And to this very day, I can see this, I still have the scar. And every time I look at the scar, I remember what caused it. I am healed. I don't feel any pain. Thank God. But guess what? There's still a mark, a reminder. That, look here, you did that. That's what happened. There's some, there some permanent consequences that come. Some of us, we might get forgiveness for having fornication, but you might catch syphilis or you might catch AIDS. And while you're forgiven, the consequences that you're going to die. Some of us, we get pregnant, amen, and you're going to have to care that child. And sometimes it's even harder when you raise a child like that because it feels as if, God, why did I do this? You know, all of these things, the permanence, the permanence of the consequences. Not only that, number five, you can lose some blessings. Some temporal blessings can be lost. Sin may permanently exclude individuals from certain temporal blessings or opportunities. So, for example, we see where Moses, even though he asked for forgiveness, he stood there and he watched them going into the promised land. And it was a temporal blessing that he lost. Thank God, while he was alive, he could not go over. Thank God that later on, we see we're on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was seen in the promised land. But prior to that, amen, while he was alive, the blessing, that beautiful land that he saw ahead of him, he could have only see it, but he couldn't engage in it. There are some blessings, there are some things that God would have us to do, and we can't do it. And we know why we can't get engaged in it. Because the blessing, there, when you start to do some things, if you were a person that, that steal money, you know that they're not going to put you in a certain position. And worse if it's known. You lose the opportunity to be trusted with some things or to be trusted to do some things. So while you might get forgiveness, you have to understand that we have to deal with people and there comes some time where God himself will not put you in a position because of the disgrace it will cause. Because while God will forgive you, it will cause a mar on the ministry. David went through some serious thing also. After he committed adultery, despite his repentance, God's judgment was upon him. God said, the sword shall never depart from your house. That's 2 Samuel 12, verse 10. I will say again, his house, we said it a while ago, the temporal blessing that he wants, he wants to build the house, he couldn't even, he, what David wanted, he couldn't even do it. So while he remained king in Israel, the rain that he got was marked with turmoil and internal conflicts and, and, and sin and whatever the case is, all because of the temporal blessing that he lost because of the of sin that he committed. Can I tell somebody that even after you have repented, some doors may remain closed due to the repercussions of past transgressions, some opportunities that some things that you could have done some relationships that 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 could have been great, I mean, a good friendship, but because of what you did, it it, it it there's always this this funny thing because of how you live. Some leadership opportunities that could have been afforded to you, you lose it because of. And I've seen, I know some powerful men, and because of how they, what they did, even to men of God, Amen. To this day, them bunks are all over the place. They're all over the place. They're nowhere, and there are men that would have been in esteemed position, but, they, but God would not have it to be so because of the, the, the past. The doors were closed. 
So while they buy this, and notice I said temporal blessing because it only applies to this life. Ultimately, you'll be saved if you're repenting, but there are some consequences that comes with sin. Number six, you have long-term repercussions also. Sin can lead to long-term consequences that extend beyond individual life, your life. Deuteronomy chapter five, Moses writes it himself, thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. In other words, the consequence did not just stop with them, but it went as far as the second. You ever notice some things where somebody commit a sin and, and they got pregnant at 16 and then they have a child and a child come and get pregnant at 16 and it came tend to be cycle that cannot be broken. You know, something like, like your life, the repercussions from your life is being passed down to generation and generation and generation after you're dead. And it's all because of you. Therefore, we have to make sure so we set things right. There's a seriousness to sin. And it's important for us to obey God's guidance. Again, this point underscores the need for genuine repentance and recognition while forgiveness is available. The consequences of sin can be far-reaching, brothers and sisters, and they can be enduring. We have to be very careful. It can affect future generations, passing on weaknesses and vulnerabilities that could have been avoided if we had just obeyed God. But there's also a last consequence for sin, if not, if you have not repented, and that's eternal death. Goes back to the verse that we started with, for the wages of sin is death. That's the, that, that's the ultimate thing about sin. It, you don't see it right away, but at the end of the day, the wages, the payment, imagine you work, when they talk about wages, they link it to payment. The payment for sin is death. And the Bible is full of examples. Adam and Eve, because of their disobedience, they were cast out of the garden and they brought sin and death to themselves and the entire world. We start in Genesis chapter 3. We see because of, of how wicked men were, the entire world at the time was destroyed with a flood. Every living creature, everybody, was destroyed except Noah and his family because they were righteous. That's in Genesis chapter 6 to 9. And you might say, oh, that's Old Testament. But let's jump to the New Testament. We say Ananias and Sapphira, who their actions, because of the, they, 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 their sinful action, were holding part of the proceeds from the sale of their property. And not only that was not the problem, because of their lying to the man of God. You can imagine, you start before, you have to be careful when you go before him. Men of God, I start be disrespectful. I start be rude. I start telling lies. If we careful, because some of us are dead spiritually, we don't even know it already. And then I sense the fire of deceitful action with the whole part of the land, resulting in their sudden death, sudden judgment from God. Acts chapter five. We can talk about Cain and Abel because of his sin. Death came in. We can talk about the tower of, of Babel. Where, 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 where confusion came. There, is, there, there are consequences because of, of, of sin. Brothers and sisters, there are some consequences for sin. And while this might not be a Bible study that, 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 that make you feel good, it's a Bible study that tells us that we must be aware of what is happening. Nowadays, we are living like too much, too close, too close to how the world walk, too close to how the world talk. Nowadays, we are forgetting that we are, we are, we are not, we don't belong here. Praise God. We are pilgrims passing through. Some of us have, as, as pastor would say, we put our stakes too deep in Egypt sand, not realizing that God have a place for us in Canaan. 
Some of us have, 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 have made things have become so light to us. It's so easy now to give it a person that part of your mind. Or for just tell them off. It's so easy now to just speak ill of everybody and anybody. You don't care who the person is. And the truth be told, we shouldn't do that irrespective of who they are. We should be respectful even to the least in the house of God. Because guess what? They are valuable to God. They are, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are the apple of God's eyes. They are jewels to God in his crown. And you find it easy to talk bad about anybody and any person. And sometimes we forget that some the same persons who we talk bad about. Amen. God can use that person to pull you out. Be careful, brethren. Be careful. Nowadays, we must be, be careful what we say. Be careful what we say about each other. Be careful what we do. Be careful how we dress. Let our lives be an example to the world. Let us stand out. Because there are consequences for sin. Tonight I'm reminding us as I close of the seven things that we spoke about. There's a deception deception for sinful thinking. Meaning that you think that you can sin and seek forgiveness later. But as I reminded you, that shows us, it reflects a profound misunderstanding of sin and its nature. What sin does to you. I've seen, I've seen people who have been so healthy and strong and because of the sicknesses, diabetes or cancer or whatever, it, it's pulled them down to nothing, to skin and bone. That's what sin does to the spiritual man. Once you have introduced it into your system, God bless, if, if, if God don't cure you of it, what it does. It's like a virus. It's like people will go on a computer, you just click, 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 click. And you realize you click on the wrong thing and it, it, it introduces something on your system and all of a sudden every file get locked. Everything get corrupt and mash up. Your computer stop working because there's a virus on it. That's what happens when you have introduced a foreign element into your spirit, man. First of all, there's an escalation of sin. Number one, just reminding them as I close, sin will take you further than you want to go. Will keep you longer than you intend to stay and will cost you more than you are intended to pay. Number two, sin doesn't just affect you, it impacts others. So when you sin, amen, you put other people in danger that you convert, those people that are looking up to you. Amen. I, I was telling uh I was telling um a group on Saturday about the difference between the the, the stop clock. The clock that you put in your pocket and the and a big clock on the outside. The clock that you put in your pocket, it only or I'll be on your hand, it's you alone to affect. So if the clock is off, I mean probably you just miss the time. But if it's a big clock that everybody uses that shows to the public, when that clock is off, it it, it, it leads a lot of people astray. Because if it's supposed to be uh 10 o'clock. And the clock is showing eight o'clock. You might think you have two hours left and you're and you missed a lot of things. That's what happened as child of God. We are set as the clock for the entire world. And once we are off, a lot of people who are looking for you for guidance are misled. Impact others. Not only that, the longer you stay out there, the more difficult it is for you to repent. To the point where you can become blinded, where God even send an angel, a word that is supposed to speak to your heart right in front of you. Amen. Till, 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 till God do a miraculous thing, like I make a donkey talk, and you don't even realize that the donkey is talking because you are so blinded by sin. It becomes a difficult place for you to find repentance because your, your conscience have now become seared with Hatayan. Then number four, even if you find a place of repentance, there are some permanences of the consequences that come along with sin. There are some scars that will that will be there for a very long time. There are some stuff that are going to that, that are going to make you feel out of it. They're going to forever be in your face. Bear that in mind. Not only that, there are some temporal blessings that you might lose as a result. 
you are forgiven. But like David, amen, he was not able to do some things. And as a consequence, even though he found forgiveness, amen, the, 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 the sword never left his house. Even though he found forgiveness, amen, we find rebellion and, and lying and killing and murder and all this happen as a consequence of the action. If you sow mango seed, you're going to get mango tree. And when you sow mango tree, you get enough mango. That's what, there are some blessings that you will lose. There are some consequences that come as a result of that. And also, number five, there are some blessings that you will lose as a result of that. And then there are some long-term repercussions in that will go beyond you. Amen. It might affect, amen, people down the line, generations to come. But lastly, if you don't understand sin, it will eventually pull you so far away from God that you will end up with eternal death. It gives you spiritual death where you're, where you're cut off from God. And if you will find back God, it gives you eternal death. We are forever turned off from God for eternity. Let us be cognizant that, look here, God can come anytime. And therefore, it's important that we recognize this and live as God would have us to do. Tonight, I pray, God, that we have learned something tonight. There are consequences to sin. It's important that we live a life that is pleasing to him. God bless you. God bless you tonight. Let's bow your heads as I close out this session tonight in prayer. Great God, we exalt you tonight. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, just for your word tonight. The consequences of sin. Help us, Lord Jesus, to realize that if there's anything, any living in our lives, anything in our lives that will that will that can, can can replicate itself helps God to get rid of it. Help us, Lord Jesus, if there's anybody that we are in malice with, that we make it right. Help us, Lord Jesus, if they are living a life as contrary. Help us, Lord, to set ourselves in order, to break up our fallow ground, and help us, Lord Jesus, to get ourselves in order. Where we talk, shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed to the word of God, the moral standard, the character of God. I pray, God, that it'll help us to always in the back of our mind to realize that sin is deceptive. There's, there's deceitfulness to sin. And not only that, once we indulge in it, there are repercussions that come. There are situations that will come that will cause us permanent, that can cause us permanent harm in the long run. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for speaking to us one more time. As we try to apply everything that we have heard tonight to our very lives, we look to you in the most exalted name, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Continue to bless the house of faith chapel. Continue to allow us to bless every person who will watch this Bible study tonight. And continue to bless us as we look to you, who is about to return soon. Help us, Lord Jesus, to have our eyes fixed on you and to say, come, Lord Jesus. Let somebody who hears his word get to know you, whom to know is life eternal. In the most exalted name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. Stay faithful. In Jesus' name.